All right, this morning I want to preach on the subject, beware of Judaizers. Beware of Judaizers. And um, part of this sermon is prompted just by current events that are going on in the Middle East. But um, I really just want to spend a lot of time focusing on the doctrine found, especially in the book of Galatians. So um, what, what am I talking about? The Middle East, if, if you still are unaware, uh, there's another battle between Hamas and, and Israel. And uh, there's been bombings going back and forth. And the reason why this is so important for us, ultimately, as Christians, is because there's a lot of false teaching out there regarding Israel, who Israel is, and just really inordinate affections and just things that are just untrue about who the nation of Israel even is. So I'm preaching against Judaizers. A Judaizer would be someone who's going to try to take, like, Christianity and make it more like the old covenant law of God. And, and they, they want to bring in and try to bring back the stuff that's been done away in the New Testament. And that's where you'll see, you'll see groups like the Hebrew Roots Movement is one that tries to Judaize Christianity. Anyone who wants to, to start, you know, observing the Sabbath or observing the Torah, they'll call it, you know, like instead of just talking about the law of God, they'll, they'll, they'll try to use these Hebrew words and references to uh, the things of God. Now look, we believe in the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? We believe that, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and we believe that it's all profitable, right? That it's, that it's good for us to learn. But there's definitely been a significant change with the New Testament, right? That the New Covenant, the New Testament has done away with the whole Levitical priesthood. So, and, and again, this is all just by way of introduction. The Levitical priesthood was Aaron and the Levites, right? Was, were, 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 and, and Aaron was a Levite. He was of the tribe of Levi. God ordained that that particular tribe were going to have the job and the duties of being the priests and of being the ministers in the house of God. So whether it be taken up and tearing down the tabernacle or whether it be in the temple that came later, all of the service, all of the offerings and the sacrifices and things that were made, everything that needed to be done the way that God ordained it should be done was to be done by the tribe of Levi. Okay? It makes sense. And there was lots of laws and these carnal ordinances and these things that were put in place of the, God said, you must do it this way. And they had their feasts and the, the sounding of trumpets. And, and, and various other things that, was, that all pertained to the Levitical priesthood. But the New Covenant, the New Testament, especially the book of Hebrews, you want to understand a lot of the differences between New Testament and Old Testament, read the book of Hebrews, which was intended for the Hebrews, right? the people who were physical descendants, the people who were uh, coming out of that Old Testament uh, I'll call it a Judaic religion. I don't, I don't like calling it that because modern day Judaism is not the religion of the Old Testament. Modern day Judaism is the religion of the Pharisees and Sadducees that we read about, particularly the Pharisees in the New Testament. When we read about Jesus Christ, when we read about those things, they are the ones that held the traditions of their fathers above the word of God. And this is what you see in modern day Judaism and in their teaching. They, they look to all the words of all these rabbis and stuff. And that's why they have uh, these other books and other volumes, massive volumes of books that, that describe their religion and that they look to for their guidance as opposed to just going to the word of God and looking to the Bible. Jesus himself even said, look, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me because they claim to believe Moses. There's a group of people that claim to believe Moses. The Pharisees were known as, well, no, no, we follow the Mosaic law. And they would, they would ardently defend that position. No, we believe Moses. But who are you going to believe, the Pharisee or Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ said, look, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me. If you really did honestly, sincerely believe in what Moses had to teach, you'd believe me because Moses spake of me. All the prophets spake of Jesus Christ. There's no way, if, if they would have really truly accepted the word of God in the old covenant, they would have accepted Jesus Christ as well. But he said flat out that they didn't. And they continued, and that's why they crucified him. 
Because the religion of the Pharisees, to the religion of the Pharisees, Jesus Christ was a blasphemer. Who can say he's the son of God? Well, he's a blasphemer. In their understanding, he's the Messiah, he's the son of God, no way. You're making yourself equal with God. And look, this stuff is all in scripture. Like that, that that's their mindset. And, and it's why it's so easy to say it's the same religion of Judaism today because Judaism today still rejects Jesus Christ. They still would say he's a blasphemer. They still would say, no, he was not of God, right? All of the things that were taught then are the same things held today. What regard, what special extra privileged regard did Jesus have or the disciples have to the Pharisees? None. Now, it, it, you have to be careful when speaking about this subject too because people use or have a different understanding when you just say the word Jew. It's been conflated between an ethnic Jew of someone who's physically just from the area of Israel or whatever versus the religion of Judaism being a Jew, okay? And, and, and it really is important to understand the distinction between the two because there was a group of people, the Jews in general of the physical nation was a nation that God had chosen starting with Abraham and then his descendants, but he had chosen that nation to be the nation that was going to be the lighthouse to the world, that he was going to use that group of people, that small people that started out from, from very humble beginnings to bring them through uh, their trials, their tribulations, to bring them through, but to deliver the word of God unto that people. So they were going to consist of, that's why he had the Levites, and they, the genealogies were important to understand where your position was, if you were going to be a Levite or not, if you're going to minister in the house of God or not, and being part of that. Now, the Old Testament allowed for other people of other nations to join themselves and become part of Israel. But the way that God interacted was he wanted to have that physical nation there. Does that mean everybody in, that lived in that physical nation were saved? No, it doesn't. But that's the way that God chose to deliver his word, to, to communicate with mankind, essentially was to use this nation and to use the priests and to use that office to deliver his word. They weren't all saved because salvation has always been by grace through faith. Our individual eternal salvation has always been by putting our trust in the Lord believing on him that and we'll get into this because we're going to go kind of do a higher level look at the whole book of Galatians and I mean if you want a book <laughs> that could tell you very clearly how salvation has been by faith and not of works and how it kind of applies all the time Galatians is a great book for that Amen. Hebrews also because Bible says it was impossible for the blood of bulls and of goats to save like it's never been possible those animal sacrifices they could never take away sins like that, that doesn't make the actual atonement for the punishment for your sins and like the, the hellfire punishment, the blood of a bull or a goat could never take that away. They were all representative of the savior to come whose blood can take that away, Jesus Christ. His blood washes away that sin. So again, salvation, the same, yes, but God's dealing with people and, and the nation of Israel, no, those were separate. So the nation was set apart as being important for God to deal with as a people. But when we get to the New Testament, he finally got sick and tired of that people of that nation not doing what he was commanding them to do and just going after other gods. And, you know, and ultimately, when he finally sent his son, that, that, that rejection of the son was the last straw. That was enough for God. Because throughout history, they'd gone after other gods and they've gone into captivity, right? They were taken out of their land when they were, when they were gone into captivity into Babylon, for example, and then getting back into their land. And, you know, and, and they've had their issues with being obedience to the Lord. But the final straw came when Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. That was it. And that's when God said, okay, we're done. And they were literally replaced. 
with a nation that was going to bring forth the fruit serve, the nation that was actually going to say, hey, we'll serve the Lord. But what I'm, I'm kind of getting, I know I'm, I'm doing a really high-level overview of this doctrine just in case you're not familiar with it, um, which is, but it's still not the, the, the main thrust of what I want to teach today. Judaizers want to come in and, and bring in the elements of the Levitical priesthood that are no longer supposed to be in place. I mean, for example, now, now, I, don't, I haven't seen anyone this brazen yet, but the day will probably come where people want to start doing sacrifices, these Judaizers, that would be blasphemous, right? If someone were to, were to say, oh, no, we need to start doing these animal sacrifices and stuff today, it's like, no, Jesus already was the sacrifice. He was the lamb. Like, you never do that again. But there's other aspects, too. For example, the Sabbath. You know, the New Testament teaches us that, hey, one man seemeth one day above another, another man seemeth every day alike. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Uh, you, you can see that in the book of Romans that it explains that, you know, it doesn't, the days don't matter anymore. And the reason why is because the Sabbath day, for example, Jesus Christ is our rest. So there's a, the, the six days you're supposed to work and the seventh day is a day of rest where man does no work at all symbolizing salvation, our rest when we enter into heaven can, is only brought into by us doing no works, right? It's, it's a faith-based salvation. It's a faith-based rest. And when Jesus Christ came, we enter into his rest because he did all the work for us. He labored. We rest in Christ. So now that is fulfilled. That element or that aspect of the law has been fulfilled again through Christ. The feasts, you know, there, there's, there's, we can still learn from them, but we don't keep them. Because all the feasts in, it, it, uh, had sacrifices, which we don't do. So how are we going to have a feast without having the sacrifices? You see, like, like there's so many elements here that we don't want to do. But beyond what we actually see in the scripture of people wanting to bring in these other things, Judaizers will just bring in other aspects of like Judaism to try to make that part of Christianity today and that's also you need to look out for so you'll have and, and this happens unfortunately so frequently in Christian churches like for one for example you'll just see uh, many churches will have American flag and a flag for the nation of Israel just just flying in the church now if you'll notice we don't have any of those flags we don't have the American flag and we don't have Israel's flag because we fly under the banner of the cross. Amen. That's where our allegiance is. Like, I'm, I, and I'm not, for, you know, this is a whole, man, I'm, I'm going to start opening up all these doors. Like the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, I'm not pledging my allegiance to a flag of a, of a, of a wicked country. Which, look, hey, I'm, I'm thankful that I'm in the United States of America. I really am because we do get to enjoy a lot of freedoms and God has blessed this country tremendously. But you can't really say we're a very righteous nation as a whole either. So how can I pledge my allegiance to that? Like, like, no, 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 no. I pledge my allegiance to Jesus Christ. That's who I am faithful to. That's who I'm going to serve, right? So it's not about these flags and other things. But beyond just the flags, like, that's just the tip of the iceberg. People bring in all kinds of stuff from this. You know, have you seen those, those white, like, prayer shawls or whatever? And they've got the, the blue ribbons on them and all this other stuff. It's like, look, hey, the, the ribbons of blue, again, Levitical priesthood. The garments that the, 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 the priests wore, Levitical priesthood. You see this in groups, like I said, Hebrew roots. You've got the black Hebrew Israelites out there. And again, those are kind of fringe groups, but they're really focused on this race and racism, trying to esteem the race of the Hebrews above everybody else. Now look, the Jews, especially religious Jews, participate in that mindset. And again, I'm speaking broadly. This isn't every single individual. It's in a general sense. Especially though the religion of Judaism, they look at Gentiles, which by the way, the definition of Gentile is a non-Jew, as being inferior. And look, this goes all the way back even to the Old Testament. This is even seen, it's witnessed in the book of Acts, even by the disciples. This mindset, okay, and, and I, I preach an entire Bible study going through the book of Acts 
And you can see this and you had to see their shift in their understanding and thinking of Gentiles because it had been ingrained in their culture so much that they are God's chosen people, elevating them above everybody else to the point to where they would not even like eat with Gentiles. Like they couldn't even have a meal with them. That's out of hand. That's never found in scripture that you can never do that. There's no law against that. There's nowhere in God's word that says that you have to treat people of other nations that way. It never says that. In fact, it says like the foreigners that come in, you treat them as one homeborn in the land. That they're under the same law as you if they're going to join themselves to your nation. But even going to another nation, it doesn't say that you can't like go out and have a meal with somebody of another nation. I mean, how, how else are you going to even get the word out, right? How are you going to evangelize and show people who are deceived the way of truth if you can't even like talk to them or communicate with them? And God had to open up their understanding and show like he did with the apostle Peter, you know, hey, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common or unclean. When he saw the animals coming down, he said, Peter, you know, slay and eat and, and that whole uh, vision. But the, the teaching was there that they still had this mindset of being, you know, hey, we're God's chosen people. And that mindset persists even today and not just among Jews, but also among Christians. I mean, I was taught that Israel or the Jews are like special people because they're God's chosen people. I never fully understood it. It was never really explained that well, but it's always just been a little confusing. Like, well, wait a minute. I mean, the best thing for us to do is to believe in Jesus Christ. The modern day Jews reject Jesus Christ still to this day, yet they're still God's chosen people. Like, do they just get a special pass? Like, like why is that? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense because it's not true. And people who view the Jews this way, it's inordinate, it's not right. And that's one of the big problems in Christianity today, and the ramifications are huge. The reason why I'm even going into this is because it is a big deal, because it's not just like, oh, well, if you want to esteem those people better, whatever. There's way more implications than that. One, if you just thought someone had an instant pass into heaven based on how they were born, what would be the, the, the reason to even give the gospel to that person? Oh, yeah, I mean, they're special people anyways. They're going to heaven. That's damning. That's damning to their soul when you don't open up the mouth and preach the word of God to them, preach the gospel to them, because they need Jesus like everyone else needs Jesus. Okay? And if they don't put their trust in Jesus Christ, they're going to die and go to hell. Because that chosen people doesn't apply in that way at all. Every person needs Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in order to be saved. Every single person. So that's one aspect of it. But how about this? When people start elevating this other, this other people and it affects our foreign policy and our decisions in making war, sending off our children to go and fight in a war for people who reject Christ and voting on sanctions and voting on all of this other stuff and all the turmoil and this battle that's going on over there between two nations that both reject Christ. A Muslim nation and a Jewish nation. And the answer to, to that dilemma and that problem is Jesus. It's not bombs. It's not missiles. It's not sanctions. It's Bibles. Like that's, what, that's how a Christian ought to view these things. This is, this is the Bible. Now, again, I, I think I'm taking way too much time as by way of introduction. But it, it is important to understand these things. And it's so important that I would say the entire epistle to the churches in Galatia is all about this one subject of people trying to Judaize a Christian, Christian churches. Now, here's something else that I want to bring up in light of some things that have, that have been attacks that have come against our church, too. Because most of the attacks against our church, people, and, and look, people are calling us racist. Today. If you didn't know that, I, uh, I don't mind saying what's happening because it's, it's, it's happening for real. But uh, I mean, I, I think one look around will tell you whether or not this is a racist church. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, it seems to me to be self-evident. But, you know, people get all inflamed on, and it's TikTok, too. I mean, that kind of says something in and of itself is, is where the majority of, of the hate is coming from. But 
you know, people want to take a little clip out of a sermon and then get all offended and, and they start just labeling us racist, right? But a lot of the people that have been complaining and, 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 and writing me nasty emails and stuff like that are these black Hebrew Israelites type of people where they say that, well, no, actually, the, when, the, when the tribes were scattered abroad, many of them went down into Egypt and they went down into Africa and then during the slave trade, you know, they were actually some of the lost tribes of Israel that were then brought here to America. And that's what's being taught by this group of saying, no, you're actually Hebrews. You're actually Israel. And then they just do everything based off of the color of their skin. And what I want to point out about Galatians and just remember this, okay, I did a little bit of research about Galatia, okay, just world history research. I didn't know this, but it's interesting. That country, that region of Galatia has Celtic origins. Celtic. And do we know who, who the, the Celts were, right? The European, like, like it could be Irish, you know, where, where are you going to find like a lot of white people there? Okay, and I didn't even know this because Galatia is in the Middle East. Now, why do I bring this up? Because of the people who have, who have a really bad understanding of race and ethnicity and, and, and how, what the Bible teaches about that. That's why I bring it up. And what I want to point out here is even if you believed all the apostles were black-skinned, okay, and Jesus Christ was a black-skinned man, I don't care. Like, that doesn't matter to me one bit. It really doesn't matter to me. The, 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 phys, the pigmentation in her skin means nothing to me. I don't care. I'm not saying I believe that Jesus would look like an African. I don't think that. I think he looked like a Middle Eastern, which would be a shade of brown. But whatever, right? Like, like it doesn't matter. But the reason why I bring this up is because when you start seeing the teaching here, if you're going to subscribe to this race-based type of, of, of mindset and say you believe the Bible, just understand this, that the epistle that the Apostle Paul is writing to these churches in Galatia, Galatia, these were people who were converts to Christianity, and that region of Galatia was started by the Celts just a couple hundred years before Christ. And even with intermingling with people that local area and stuff, guess what? You're going to have a lot of European type looking people in that area. And what is the Apostle Paul ta calling them? Brethren. And he uses the word Gentiles, which means non Jew. So anyone that wants to put stock in, well, we're the really, is we're really Israel and we're really the Jews and we're yo, and our skin color, your skin color, like this dispels. All of that. Because it clearly doesn't matter in New Testament doctrine. It can't. It doesn't matter. And there's so many ways to Sunday to prove this from Scripture. But it's just one more little point that just comes up. I was just like, well, wow, that's interesting. Don't you know that the gospel was in Egypt way before it was in North America? Yeah, I know. So what? That doesn't change anything. Anyways, I, that's a whole other sermon. I'm not going to re-preach that. So let's dig into this now because the whole book of Galatians, we know so this is the theme. We're going to go at a high level. We're kind of going to skip around just a little bit and get some bits and pieces of the whole book of Galatians. But this is written to the churches of Galatia for this one main topic. And we're going to start, look down in your Bible there, verse number six of Galatians chapter one. The Bible says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So we say, you know, he's the one that helped get these churches started. Him and other disciples were, were doing the, the work, teaching the good doctrine, teaching the gospel of Christ. And he's saying, I'm amazed, I'm marveling that you could be so quickly, so soon removed from that, from that good, pure gospel that we taught you unto another gospel. And he says, it, it, but it's not really another. It's not like some Hindus came and tried to teach them to follow Hinduism, right? Because it's really close. All it is, it's a perversion. It's a twisting of the right gospel. 
So they take the gospel, but then they go, Boop, and they just tweak it a little bit, but then that makes it false, right? So you take a gospel, it's by grace. You see, you take a gospel that is not of works. It is, it is free. It's a gift. It's, you know, bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. You say, but you got to go to church. But you have to be circumcised, which is what this example is. People are saying that you couldn't be saved just by grace alone. You had to also be circumcised. Like if you're not, if you're not circumcised, then so, so that one little addition perverts the gospel of Jesus Christ. That one addition all of a sudden made grace now become works. It's, very, it's the same thing as people who would say today, because this isn't as much of a deal today, with, specifically with circumcision, uh, at least not in Christianity. But and it is a little bit, but not, but not so much. Again, that's more of the Jewish influence on Christianity, which still kind of goes to this day. But it would be, there's a lot of Christian, or at least so-called Christian religions that would say, well, you have to be baptized to be saved. Like a water baptism. They say, well, no, no, believing and being baptized, they both need to be there to be saved. It's not true. Now, now you've made it by works. Even if it's just one work, it's no longer Christ alone. Now what you're saying is, well, what Jesus did on the cross, yeah, it was good, but it wasn't quite enough because you also have to get baptized. Uh, no. No, what Jesus did was enough to pay for everything. So a person that believes in Christ and never gets baptized still go in heaven when they die. A person that believes in Christ and never gets circumcised is still go in heaven when they die. And that's an important distinction to make. You have to understand that. So he says, there's some that pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse number eight, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, as, I, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. That, is, I mean, there's nothing more serious. He's just saying, look, you just need to, to go to hell. Let him be accursed. Amen. If you're gonna preach any other gospel, don't receive anyone preaching any other gospel because that does damn souls to hell. Amen. That's how serious it is. He's saying, let him be accursed. So he starts off this chapter just referencing the importance of another gospel. And he goes in depth to, into circumcision and stuff in this chapter. We're not going to get uh, uh, really deep into that. Go to chapter 2, verse number 3. Actually, we'll start reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But privately to them, which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So these people wanted to compel Titus to get circumcised because they knew he was a Greek. And of course the Greeks didn't practice circumcision, right? So they knew that, Hey, this guy is a Greek and he's now he's claiming to be a believer. Well, he needs to be circumcised. And apostle Paul is like, no, no, he doesn't. And he says, we gave place to that argument, not even for an hour. Like we didn't, we didn't just stop and be like, well, let's debate this. It wasn't, it didn't have room for debate. He knew it was wrong. Now, just to illustrate though, how important this is and actually how powerful the pressure can be sometimes for people to, to fall into this Judaizing, keep your place here in Galatians, go back to Acts chapter 16. We, saw, we see another example of a disciple, but this time he did get circumcised. So in this, in this event, in Acts, takes, is, is prior to what we're reading in Galatians, right? Just historically. So what we're going to read here in, in, in Acts chapter 16 precedes what the events in Galatia. Acts chapter 16, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him 
and took and circumcised him <coughs> now should Paul have circumcised him no no and he already says later like yeah no we're not we're not gonna do this at, at that point in the book of Galatians like I already done this once we're not doing this again okay I, I already was there for Timotheus being 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 circumcised no Titus doesn't need to be sec, uh, circumcised at all and it says here in um, it says he took and circumcised him because of the Jews it was the Jews that were putting the pressure on him and I would say this he already knew at this point that he didn't have to circumcise him also he was only doing this because of the pressure and to placate the Jews he says, because, because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they, they knew all that his father was a Greek. So he's thinking by doing this, I'm assuming, he's thinking that by doing this, he's going to just be able to establish, like, okay, you can still listen to me, or you can listen to him, to try to get them to, to not stop freaking out about circumcision. Now, the way that he would probably justify this, or any Christian might, you know, again, I, I can't speak for the thoughts of the Apostle Paul here. I don't know them. But it would make sense to be able to say something like, well, circumcision's nothing and uncircumcision's nothing, so who cares if we circumcise them, right? And you could probably take the approach of like, well, you know, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. That might be what he was thinking here. But this concept of having to bring in circumcision, though, is so important that we shouldn't be making those types of, of compromises because it's so important to understand that you can't add anything to the gospel, which is why I think he hardened his stance later on in Galatians is just like, no, we're not giving place to this argument. Because when you keep, people want to keep on bringing this stuff in, you got to put a stop to it and say, no, it doesn't mean anything. And if we flip back to chapter 15, like it's, it's, it's just so interesting because this literal concept was already addressed in chapter 15. So in chapter 16, it brings up Timotheus and saying, yeah, he got circumcised because of the Jews. But chapter 15, look at verse number one. The Bible says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So they're making this about salvation. Like, look, if you're not circumcised, you can't be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. So he was already fighting this too in chapter 15. It wasn't some small fight or just some little minor detail. Oh, we agree to disagree. No, it was no small dissension. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So the people there, they were not receiving what Paul and Barnabas had to say. And they're like, no, 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 no. Let's go ask Peter and James and John and see what they have to say about this. But they didn't need to. Look, Paul was an apostle too. Okay, you didn't need someone else to tell you that this was true. This is what the word of God says. And Paul didn't need anyone to confirm his belief either. But the people of that place wanted this confirmation. So uh, they send them down to Jerusalem. Verse three says, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria declaring the conversion of the Gentiles and they cause great joy unto all the brethren. So they're like rubbing it in their face as they're going down. They just keep declaring the conversion of the Gentiles that didn't get circumcised, mind you. So they just keep on, they're just going down going like, yep, hey, we got these people saved, man, it's awesome. We went to this nation, this nation. These people received Christ. They're receiving the Holy Spirit. They're saved, you know, as they're going down to see of this matter of whether or not people need to be circumcised to be saved, right? And when they were come to Jerusalem, verse 4, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, what we read here about the Pharisees that believed it's not necessarily exactly the same as what was stated earlier about the people who are saying you cannot be saved except you be circumcised. So this is now trying to, in, especially in the book of Acts, right? All of this stuff is newer. So this doctrine is coming out and emerging and we get to read this as it happens through the word of God. What exactly does change? Because, I mean, there, there has to be a time where people are just uncertain on how do we go forward serving the Lord now, right? The, 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 the truth needed to be revealed over the course of this time by these apostles, by the prophets, you know, 
giving the word of God to really identify how things need to change. So, so you, we have to have that understanding, especially through the book of Acts, as we're reading some of these things that they're going, well, I mean, people have been circumcised going all the way back to Abraham, right? So that's even preceding Moses. So I could understand where they might say, oh, you're, you're saved, you should get circumcised. The same way that we would say, oh, you're saved, you should get baptized, right? But we don't see them saying it was a requirement for salvation. So when it says the Pharisees that believed, I, we don't see them saying that that is a requirement for being saved. Because otherwise, they'd be like an unbeliever. I mean, they're adding works to salvation, right? But you can see where they still might say, well, no, I mean, it's still important. They should still get circumcised. And to command them to keep the law of Moses. So verse 6 says, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And what another great verse that dispels racism. So he put no difference between us and them. And who's the them there? The Gentiles. And Gentiles is a broad term meaning non-Jews. So you know who non-Jews are? Everybody but a Jew. <laughs> so it's like, that's all nations. That could be anybody. And he says, you know what? He put no difference between us and them. Isn't that enough? But no, these people, like the black Hebrew Israelites, they don't believe the Bible. Neither do the Hebrew roots people. Neither do, does anyone who's going to rely on race as why they're saved. If you're relying on your genealogy, even as the Pharisees did, which is why John the Baptist said, you know, that God is able these stones to raise up, raise up seed unto Abraham. So say not, think not to say within thyself, we have Abraham to our father. Because that's what the Pharisees thought. Hey, we have Abraham to our father. And people today of various colors will say the same thing. Hey, we have Abraham to our father. We're Hebrews. We're special. We're, we're chosen. And they think that that is why they're saved. They're fools. And they're wrong, and they're going to die and go to hell unless they can put their trust in Jesus Christ and actually believe the Bible. And, I mean, it, it's, it's so much throughout the Scripture here. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. There's no difference. He put no difference between us and them. And the reason why he's bringing it up here, though, is saying, well, well, let's just keep reading here, verse number 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Saying, look, why are you trying now to make them under that old covenant? Because circumcision was a seal of the old covenant. The covenant that God made with Abraham the circumcision was a sign of that. But the new covenant came in. We don't need that sign anymore of that older covenant because that's already, that's already taken care of. It's already done. We don't need that. And we don't need that aspect of the Mosaic law either. And he's saying, look, why are we trying to bring them in? We weren't even able to do this. So keeping the law and doing all the things of the law, we, we, we couldn't do that. So why are we trying to make anyone else fit into that category of, well, you need to do all these things to be saved? No, you don't. No, you don't. And that's what they're doing by requiring these things or saying that they have anything to do with salvation. Jump down to verse number 22. The Bible says, Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church uh, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, 
to whom we gave no such commandment. And there's people saying, no, you got to be circumcised, you got to keep the law, just as there is today. There's people saying, well, no, 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 if you're saved, you have to keep the law or else you're going to go to hell. No, there is no such commandment given regarding salvation on any of that. Now, should we follow the law of God? Yes, we should. The moral laws that were spelled out, right? The laws that were given to, for example, run the nation. Murder, stealing, raping, you know, all these things that the Bible talks about, that's not specific to the Levitical law. That's specific to, like, human law, right? The way that God just says, this is how you ought to live. And these things are all wrong and sin. And here's how you punish these things if they're done among you. Those are the elements that still remain even unto this day. But even that is nothing to do with your salvation. Whether it be murder, whether it be circumcision, whether it be baptism, none of that has to do with your, with your salvation because nobody can keep the law. Because if you become a transgressor in one part of the law, you transgress the whole law. Verse number 25 says, It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well." Fare you well. Now notice, again, the words matter. What are they actually saying? Are they saying that you have to uh, refrain from blood in order to be saved? No. They're just saying some basic things that probably really pertain to the people that they're going to, maybe sins that were a lot more common in their area, like the idolatry. So they're saying, look, just, just keep yourself from meats that are offered to idols. Which the New Testament still teaches that, that we should, even though, even though the idol is nothing and that there are these false gods are devils and we don't believe anything about them being devils and that food is just by, food by itself anyways, it still says, look, if you know that this is sacrifice, offered and sacrificed to idols, then don't eat it. For the conscience of the people around you, for other people so that they don't just think like, oh, wow, he's having regard to this false god. No, I'm just eating it because I'm hungry and, and I just want some food. I don't give a rip about your false god, right? Like, but, but the Bible's saying, well, you still don't do that. Because if it's brought up to you, now how you proceed and go forward could have an impact on, on how they perceive what you're doing. So we're charitable and we just say, yeah, no, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. And that's what we ought to do with that. And even to this day, that's what you ought to do. If people are coming up to you, say, yeah, we say, I mean, I, it's so not common today. I'd be surprised if you ever even came across that one time in your life. But maybe you will. I don't know. There's a lot of different cultures out there. If you have friends that, that, you know, light incense to some Buddha or something, and then, and then like, this is a meal for that, then you say, well, no. Sorry. But so they bring up here, you know, food, sacrifice, idols. And, and what do they end up saying? Fornication, of course, right? And, and look, we shouldn't fornicate either. But what they end up saying is that, look, if you keep yourself from these things, you'll do well. And that's a true statement. You'll do well. It doesn't say if you, if you don't keep these things, you're not saved. It doesn't mean you have to do these things to be saved. You're just saying, look, here are some things. Here are some aspects of the law. Keep this stuff, and you'll be fine. Just a small sampling of, of sins just to stay away from. And you're, and you're, and you're good, right? But, the, but the, they, they were very clear saying that, look, that stuff didn't come from us where they're troubling you and subverting your souls and saying, like, you must be circumcised to be saved, like that never came out of our mouth. So uh, it, it is a very significant deal. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 2. So again, refreshing your mind, He's talking about Titus being a Greek. He didn't get circumcised. And he's saying, we didn't need to circumcise him. And we didn't even give place even for an hour about their disputation about him needing to be circumcised. Verse 6 says, but of these who seemed to be somewhat, 
Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So he's bringing up this fact that, look, I don't need to go and, co and consult with anyone else about this matter. And like whoever it is that we're going to see, like they didn't add anything to what I already knew and what I already believed and what I'm already preaching. Like it's, it's already settled. I don't even need to give a place but for an hour because God has already witnessed the, the, the power of the gospel and the, of the Holy Ghost coming upon the people that Paul's preaching to. They're clearly getting saved. And that was evidenced by the Holy Ghost working through those people and being able to speak with other tongues and everything else, that those gifts coming upon those people, even though they weren't circumcised. Jump down to verse number 11. Now he brings up this story about Peter. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself fearing them which were of the circumcision. So again, it's fear. Why did the Paul go and get uh, Timotheus circumcised? Because of the Jews, because of their, their, their influence. Why is it that now all of a sudden Peter is separating himself before these people from the circumcision come in? It's because they came in, because the, the, the Jews came with there and they were like, they're seeing him eating. He didn't want them to see him eating with Gentiles. Because they still were holding to this concept of, oh, we can't eat with them. We're different from them. They're, they're, they're a different people or whatever. And this is such a big deal that the Apostle Paul said, needs to step in and needs to set the record straight because this can grow out of control really quickly having this wrong mindset. And this is why I'm teaching this sermon today because we have this wrong mindset about uh, unbelieving Jews it creeps in the churches and it gets out of control really quickly. We start elevating one people over another. I don't care who they are. You don't elevate people over another person. Look, you need to just be humble and realize that God is not a respecter of persons. In verse 13 says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Even Barnabas, who is, who is very clear on this subject with the Apostle Paul, he got sucked into this and, and, you know, hey, when the group is going this way, he, he followed with the group instead of standing up and saying no. And, and, you know, this is a side note. You know, I think we've got a great church here. I think we've got a lot of really good doctrine here. But if, if the church as a whole starts going wrong on a doctrine, you got to stay true to the word of God. And don't just go along with the group even though that's easier to do, right? So if Barnabas were to stand up and be like, no, 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 you guys are wrong. I'm going to eat with the Gentiles. I mean, that takes some courage, right? You have to be bold to be able to say, no, you're wrong. The easy thing is to not make any waves. Well, I mean, Peter's doing it. So I guess, I, I mean, you know, putting too much stock in what Peter does instead of recognizing, look, I already know this is wrong, so I'm not going to partake in this. I mean, like a real easy example, God forbid we get to the point where people are just like, oh yeah, we, you know, we're all just going to have some social drinks and that's all fine. So you're like, well, wait, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm staying away from alcohol. I'm staying away from that stuff. I'm, I'm not going to touch that stuff. And, and you guys ought to too. That's not right. You know, and, and in this context, it's, it's going, um, not eating with, with these Gentiles. And the apostle Paul is putting a stop to this. Look at uh, what he says there in verse number 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, he, so he's calling them out in front of everybody because he wants to make sure this stops right here. At this point, he's influenced so many people that this isn't a private conversation. Now he's going to rebuke them before everybody. He says, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? He's saying, you're not living like a Jew, so why are you putting up this front? Why are you putting up this facade? Why are you making them now look like they have to be a Jew? 
We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Highlight that verse, memorize that verse. Awesome Bible verse showing salvation is not of the works of the law. So if anyone ever tries to tell you anything, like, well, if you don't do this law, if you don't keep that commandment, or if you break this commandment, look, it's not of the law, period. No flesh is justified in God's eyes by keeping the law because we've already fallen short and broken the law, which is why we need a savior, which is why we need Christ who saves us from the curse of the law. But let's keep reading. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So just because, look, we're justified by Christ, but if we sin, does that mean that like Christ is the minister of sin, that now all of a sudden Christ is promoting sin or something? No, of course not. But we're still, we are still sinners, right? But that doesn't bring any, it doesn't detract anything from Christ. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you could keep the law to be saved, then there's no point in Christ dying on the cross. We need a savior. The law can't save you. If there is a law given unto life, whereby we could be saved, then there would be no point for Jesus coming. Because then it would just be by the law. So again, great passage here. We're going to skip over chapter 3. But again, chapter 3 goes into a lot of uh, depth. You could do that for homework about how, you know, who are Jews in God's eyes anyways? The, the, the children, who are the children of Abraham? The seed of Abraham are the, are the children of the promise. The seed of Abraham are those that put their faith in Jesus Christ. But I'm, that's, that's, I'm not going to get down too deep into that because I want to go over chapter 4 and then chapter 5 before we close up. So I'm going to go into uh, hyperspeed mode here. Verse 16, Galatians chapter 4, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. The they here, you could get it later in the context, but just so you understand, this is, this, these are the Jews. These are the Judaizers. These are the people who are trying to bring in the circumcision. These are the people who are impacting the Galatians. Because even from chapter 1 all the way through here, it's maintaining this primary focus of dealing with the problem of the people who are bringing in another gospel, of the people who are trying to tell you you must be circumcised. Now look, they may be zealous about it. They may be dynamic. They may be all up in arms about it and trying to tell you how serious this is. But he says, they zealously affect you, but not well, because what they're teaching is false. So no matter how animated, no matter how uh, uh, passionate someone might be about this topic, it doesn't make them right. Just because they have this zeal doesn't mean you just get swept up in the garbage. You have to consider it and think about what they're actually saying and don't just get carried away with the passion. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. You know, zeal's good when it's applied to good things and not only when I am present with you. Verse 19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Tell me, Ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. This is Sarah and this is Hagar, right? This is, these are the, the bondmaid. Remember when, when God promised to Abraham he was going to have a son? That son was meant to come through Sarah. That was Isaac, okay? But Abraham, as he was getting older, they both started to doubt. Abraham and Sarah started to doubt the, the promise of God and thought like, well, maybe we need to do something different here. 
So he had a handmaid, and, that, and, and, he, and he took this other woman who was a bondservant to them to, to use to bring forth a son, and that's where Ishmael came from. So Ishmael was that child that was born of the bondmaid, but Sarah and Isaac, that was the, the child that was born of the free woman. And this is, now he's bringing this up because it happened, but there's a, a, a much deeper meaning he's going to explain here in verse number 24, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. So now he's, he's applying this, story, this, this event that happened with Abraham, and he's saying these are the two covenants. So the two children that were born, the one of a bondmaid, the other of a free woman, are representative of the old covenant and the new covenant. Look at, uh, let's keep reading here. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Now, what came from Mount Sinai? The law. That's where the law of Moses was, or the law of God was delivered to Moses in Mount Sinai. That's the old covenant. And that brings people into bondage. Why? Because we're all transgressors of the law. That's what makes us sinners. We've broken God's law. Now we're a transgressor. We're a sinner. And that only brings to us death. Now the law is good. God's law is good. It's holy. It's righteous. But because we break that law, it's a curse to us. That brings us into bondage is a bondage of sin. Verse 25 for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. That Jerusalem, which now is, that's the unbelieving Jews. That's that religion where they're still trying to claim the law and salvation by works. Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. We, brethren, who's he speaking to? Galatians. Paul is a Hebrew, clearly. He's of the tribe of Benjamin, right? He, he, we know, according to Scripture at least, that, that he... He has his genealogy. He knows what tribe he's from. But what's he doing? He's calling the Galatians brethren. These are new converts. And he's standing in doubt. It's clear they're new converts because he's saying, like, look, how quickly you're removed from the gospel that we taught you. It's not like these were some diasporic Jews that were there. That he's, you know, like, no, these are new converts from Galatia of the Gentiles that believed. And what's he doing? He's calling them brethren. And he says, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Hey, we're just like Isaac. We are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. People who trust in the works-based salvation, uh, and the Jews specifically, the Pharisees, they persecuted those that were of the promise, those of the new covenant, those that put their trust in Christ. He's saying it's even, and you know what? That's always been the way it is. People of the false religions have always persecuted those who have been of faith. That's why all the prophets were references. Look at all the things that happened to God's prophets throughout history. Read the books of the prophets and see what happened to them. How were they treated? Not well, by and large, and why? Because of what they preached, because of what they believed. And, and preaching the word of God comes with those trials and tribulations. Let's see, where did I leave off here? Verse 30. Yeah. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Cast out the bondwoman. What's that? That's representative of the old covenant. So people who want to bring in that old covenant, or people are adhering to it, you know what it says? Cast them out. It doesn't say raise their flag up in church. It doesn't say send your children to go fight for them. Just cast them out. 
hey, we're children of the free. We don't want any of their religion. I'm never going to invite a rabbi here to teach us about the Bible. Okay, I'm not going to invite people who reject Christ to teach us about their culture and what they do and elevate them as some special people. I'm not going to respect their person. Now, look, as Christians, we ought to preach the gospel to them. But we ought to preach the gospel to them like we would to anyone else in the whole world. Because they're no better than anyone else. We don't, we don't not preach the gospel to them, but we don't just make sure, like, like well, they're going to be first. Doesn't matter. You know who's first is the people in our area, whoever they are. You know who's first is the poor, the poor and the needy. That's, that's who we're going to reach first, and then we'll keep going up and reaching everybody. And whether they're Jew, whether they're Gentile, whether they're you know, Muslim, whether they're Hindu, doesn't matter. They all need Christ. Galatians 5, last place I'll have you look. Galatians 5, let's close this up. Verse number one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, before you think, like, wait a minute, I'm circumcised. What does that, does that mean I'm not saved? No, that's not what he's talking about. It's... Again, in the context of the whole passage, there are people saying you must be circumcised to be saved. So if you're trusting that, what he's saying is, hey, well, then if you're circumcised, Christ doesn't profit you anything. Because now you've chosen to, 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 have, to, to believe that you have to keep the law for your salvation as opposed to just Christ alone. So he's saying if, if that's where you're at, well, good luck. Because, like, you can't just take circumcision. You're going to have to take all of it. That's what he's saying. I mean, this is in the context of all of Galatians. That's what he's saying here. Verse number three. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. You've got to keep all of it. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you look at this, and this is the key. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. So you don't have grace because you think you're justified by the law. You think that the law is going to save you. You think that your righteousness and your holiness and adherence to the law is going to save you. You don't have grace. You've got to keep all the law now and good luck with that because no one's been able to do that. None of the Old Testament Jews were able to do that. None of the New Testament Jews are able to do that. No people on earth are ever able to do that. The only person who's able to do that was Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh. He did that. He was able to keep the law in order to pay for our sins ultimately. I mean, he did everything right, but then he was that perfect sacrifice that was able to make the atonement for our sins. Verse number four, uh, for, excuse me, verse number five, for we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. This is why it's, he's going into so much detail. This is why he was stood Peter to the face. Look, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of works makes it all works. A little bit of this, this impure doctrine regarding salvation is a big deal. And a little bit of Jew worship is going to cause big problems. And again, I'm not standing here in hatred of the Jews. I hate Judaism. I hate the false religion. I hate, the, I hate the religion that teaches that Jesus Christ was not God in the flesh. I hate the religion that says that Jesus Christ is not the Savior of the world. I hate that religion with all my heart. But ethnically, they're no different than anyone else to me. And I don't want to see, I, I don't want to see brown, darker brown-skinned people being killed with bombs or lighter brown-skinned people or white people or whatever getting killed with bombs. I don't want to see any of it. I'm not for it. But I'm not going to, gonna. I mean, people who both reject Christ, how do you pick a side on that? Verse, 5, verse 10 says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you'll be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Anyone that's bringing in this stuff, they're going to have their judgment to deal with. 
And you see here, you know, you could go through the whole book of Galatians later. I was just trying to pick out some significant portions here. Like this whole book is about that subject. It's about this subject of people bringing in works for salvation and the, the, the blending of a false religion, a works-based religion with the true religion. And we shouldn't stand for that and we should have nothing to do with that. And we need to be separate and sanctified and set apart as, as Christians and like, like Brother Devin's sermon, you know, Christian privilege. Like, like we identify as Christians, not as people in any particular racial group or any other group for that matter. Even, even within America, look, Christians are, is what we want everyone to be and to, to become a part of Christianity by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Because the things that happen in this world, at the end of the day, it's only here for a moment. We're going to spend an eternity either in heaven or hell. So... Those that, that, the Bible says, he that believeth on him shall not be condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's what it all boils down to. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, love you. Thank you so much for, uh, for the great wisdom that you can teach us through your word. I pray that you please help us to have a biblical understanding of this world instead of uh, what the, the news and the media try to push down, down our throats. And I pray that you please help us to have a pure religion that we could uh, serve you in truth and in honesty and sincerity and that you would open up our understanding and that we wouldn't believe in false doctrines or have uh, uh, false ideas about, about the truth, but that you could just clear things up for us, Lord, through your word. Uh, help us ever to increase our wisdom. And, and Lord, please help us today. We go out and we preach the, the good news of salvation by grace through faith in your son, Lord, uh, to, to people who... Um, for unbelievers and, and God, please bless those efforts this afternoon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.